A new United Nations World Economic Situation and Prospects Report for 2024 stated that Nigeria's increasing public debt, persistent inflation, as well as its rising cost of living pose serious risk to the country's economic growth this year. Nigeria's annual inflation rate increased for the fifth consecutive month to 34.19% as Nigerians battle with high living crisis. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, Released, report released on Monday, the June figure is 0.24% higher than the 33.95% recorded in May. The lowest figure in 2024 was 29.90% recorded in January. However, on a month-on-month -month basis, the headline inflation rate in June 2024 was 2.3%, which was 0.17% higher than the rate recorded in May 2024 meaning that in the month of June 2024, the rate of increase in the average price level is higher than the rate of increase in the average price level in May 2024. Also, the MBA says that food inflation rate in June 2024 rose to 40.87% on a year-on-year -year basis, which was 15.62% points higher compared to the rate recorded in June 2023. Joining us now, on this show as we review Nigeria's increasing public debt, persistent inflation, as well as its rising cost of living, is Isili Eibe, an economist and director at SCAP Management. Thank you, Doctor. Always yes, a good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us as well. I mean, let's leave the figures aside. IMF says they've downgraded GDP growth in Nigeria from 3.3% to 3.1%, and that the projection for next year will just be around 3%. And then we have this, you know, data from uh, the Bureau of Statistics saying inflation is getting worse. Food inflation is getting worse. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the effect on our lives is even worse from what we experience as ordinary people of Nigeria. Now, what can we do to rescue this economy? Monetary tightening uh, policy, IMF says, oh, is a good policy. Cash transfer is a good policy, IMF says. But here in Nigeria, we seem to have a different uh, view of the reality. So what else can we do? I think, look, we need to start somewhere. And what I mean by that is you can't grow unless you have dealt with the inflation problem. In fact, I believe that the main reason why the uh, IMF downgraded our growth numbers is because of inflation. Because the higher the inflation is, the less your real growth is. And that's, that's essentially what your, your GDP growth is. It's real growth. So you tackle inflation, which is what the central bank is trying to do. But I'll add that we haven't really seen much of, I would say, support from the fiscal side of things. The fiscal side has been actually counteractive to what the central bank has been doing, contradictory, in the sense that they've been more expansionary and it's the reason why you know, I'm advocating for a check you know, with respect to government spending. Uh, we're at the cusp of a debt crisis. And you know, this excess borrowing as though we're still in the COVID era. I mean, we're seeing this across a lot of countries, actually, where we're spending like as if we're, we're in COVID. You have this massive stimulus. It really needs to change. I mean, debt levels in Nigeria have risen significantly, about 18% per annum for the last roughly 10 years or, or so. We're now at about, I mean, I said the first quarter, about 118 trillion. I expect that that will close this year at about almost 150 trillion naira, and possibly somewhere close to about 200 by the end of 2020, 200 trillion by the end of 2026. You know, it's not sustainable at all. And, and I think that the government needs to start thinking about that. And it's very, very important. I'd like to stress the fact that now that the Trump presidency is now very possible. You are very sure? It's very possible now. I mean, if we talked about this issue two weeks ago, I would have argued that eh, there's a slim chance it's possible that Biden wins. But I think now there's a great chance that Trump wins. The implications for Nigeria is that oil prices are going to tank. Okay? That's his mandate. His mandate is to get oil production in the U.S. up that will definitely increase output in the global economy and crash oil prices. Very bad for Nigeria. 
And it's the reason why we need to start thinking and planning ahead of that. We can't sustain the current debt levels that we have. All right. Uh, you, so SCAP management, which we lead, has um, produced this document on, you know, just analyzing Nigeria's soaring debt. And so I'm glad that we've um, come into that conversation because, like you said, it is, it is something that we must begin to think seriously and plan seriously about. Um, I mean, very general question, first of all, is that do you think that this government is planning or serious about addressing this challenge that we have currently? That's one. But very importantly, the, the markers of Nigeria's public debt, according to this report, you identified fuel subsidy, narrow devaluation, additional borrowings due to weak government revenue, higher interest rates. And when you look at four of them, it's hopeless because, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry to use that word. I, I try to move away from that. But when you look at it, I don't see how we're going to, this issue is not going away anytime soon. It's interesting you mentioned fuel subsidy, even though the Nigerian government and NNPCL have been adamant that there's no fuel subsidy. There are some explanations around that. So I'd like you to speak to that. Now, evaluation, I don't know how we're going to come out of this. It's still at 1500 to a dollar. Additional borrowings, we can see there's still the minimum wage that they said they're going to adjust the, um, the uh, what's it called now, the budget to accommodate that. So that's higher spending. Supplementary, so, budget. supplementary budget. So that's higher spending. Higher interest rate, Dr. Batia just talked about how despite mo tightening, monetary, um, policy, policy. tightening monetary policies, you said contradictory um, fiscal policy. How we, this is, it just looks like, well, how are we going to get um, out of this? It, it's ridiculous. Like I said, we're spending as though we're still in COVID, you know, mm. when, you know, there was stimulus. And we really need to cut back. I think that the way I'd approach it is say, look, we want to cut overall spending by 50%. We can do it based on the current budget, which is, I'll say, closer to 30 trillion for this year. Uh, first of all, we don't even have the money to, to fund that, no, okay? No. Yeah. Uh, I suspect that almost half of that will be from borrowing. So more borrowing, yeah. Okay, so I think it's very important that, and, and maybe if I tackle the, the issues you raised, the additional borrowing, mm -hmm. that's where it's coming from, is the, the need to fund this 30 trillion budget subsidy is, it's a, <laughs> sorry, it's a, almost a big scandal. You know, um, I don't know if your producer could pull up uh, perhaps slide, uh, slide, uh, slide six, where I basically emphasize the fact that, you know, subsidy today, we, we're spending about almost six, six trillion this year. So on, why, do, on fuel why subsidy. are they adamant that they are not paying fuel subsidy? I mean, I mean the, in, the indicators are clear that they are, but I, they are I think adamant. that would be a question for the government, but I'm just telling you a fact, okay? okay. We so will that's your spend, fact against their own fact. Yes, we will spend close to $6 trillion on fuel subsidy this year based on what we have seen so far. Cumulatively, yeah, that over, report that they drew. That cumulatively over the last 14 years, we have spent about $25 trillion on subsidy. Okay? That's the equivalent of another Dangote refinery of about 650,000 barrels a day. Okay? That's the equivalent of about 500,000 bed hospitals, okay, that is the equivalent of about 150,000 classroom university. I, I can go on. 12,000 kilometer road. That's, that's about 10% of what we currently have. So, so it's a... It's on, it, the figures you had asked for is on screen now. Okay, so, yeah. so, so it is a serious issue okay. and, and we need to address it, okay? okay. Because uh -huh. we're sacrificing critical infrastructure for subsidy, that doesn't make sense. You know, if I were to even go a bit further, okay, we spend about roughly 6,000 naira per capita, just based on the budget, there are no budget. 6,000 naira per capita, that's 6,000 naira per capita, okay? okay? I could pull out of my pocket. Yeah. That's what we spend per person on healthcare, okay? <laughs> on security, we spend about 9,500 naira per person, okay? Sorry, that's education. On, 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 that's, that's education, about 9,500, okay? We are currently generating roughly about, or we will generate about roughly 54,000 Naira per capita from oil revenues. Half of that is spent on subsidy. It doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, Especially given all the statistics I already yeah, pointed out it, on health, it's, it's, security, education. It's good education. you that, yeah. but part of these figures, I also want you to add Plus the $2 billion that NNPC connected for Portacot Refinery that they said was going to start in December, mm -hmm. that has not started. I just want to chart the trajectory of the who are those that are chopping the money. Plus the president that said he wants jets. Mm -hmm. 
as we speak now. Mm. We are going to shell out over $150 million for that. So $150 million plus $21 billion, which is about close to another $20 million for the new vice presidential quarters he just finished. To him, as a person, individual, has collected about $200 million. If I extrapolate and say what that $200 million will give us, I know definitely that $200 million will give us many blocks of six classroom, will give us community health care center. If I say we are building one community health care center, the need of 35, 40 million naira with equipping it, that $200 million will give you well over 50 to 100, you know. And these are the real projects. So can we speak to the waste in the office of the number one citizen? Because that's a very paramount waste. To I mean, I already highlighted that. What he's also spending on his airplanes, yeah. his this, his yacht, and everything, and all the supplementary budget he's mm. taking at the expense of the people. Can we also speak to that? Why I'm saying speak to that is because you see what Ruto had to do recently in Kenya when the protest started. Because these guys don't even realize that we're a die street. They don't realize that we're doomed. We definitely don't need the type of protest that Kenya had. I mean... Besides the loss of lives, the economic losses are also significant. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's also very important that the perhaps the political elites be careful not to trigger that kind of a protest. We don't want to go there, and so that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing that we need to we need to we need to embrace some level of austerity. Okay, and that should start from the, the political class yes, as well. Not us. You know, cutting. The budget, you know, the unnecessary waste, and, and all those things that we all know uh, that I think could infuriate the public, especially when you start talking about increasing taxes, which which normally would happen as you go into a bit of a of a, of a debt but crisis really, or issue. Who are they? Is it businesses that are not viable? Is it businesses that can't produce? Is it businesses that the environment has stifled? I mean, we're talking about thirteen airlines that defaulted on their leases. FX issues and all of that. They don't even have space to go do their maintenance and all of that. Their money is still trapped with the CBN. Most of these airlines, their money is still trapped with the CBN. And that's when the CBN talks about, oh, we've dispensed all the cash people that need cash. Their money is still with the CBN. So is it these airlines or these businesses that are already st struggling for their lives are going to pay taxes? No, I mean, look, they are definitely... We're definitely in a very, very difficult place. Um, and so I think it's very important that the government starts to look for a solution. I, the way I would approach it is sort of a three-step, where you, you have you know, what perhaps the immediate or short-term uh, solutions or measures should be, medium-term and long-term, you know, on the short-term side. Uh, to be honest, on all these fronts, there are already actions that are already being taken. I guess the question is to what level, uh, I guess, or, you know, uh, how much effort is being put on, on all those efforts to, to address them. You have the monetary policy efforts that are currently ongoing, you know, through the increases in, in interest rates. Talking mm -hmm. about debt. Yeah. Whether bilateral debt or multilateral debt or domestic debt. Mm -hmm. It's not new. The story is not new. Yeah. Under uh, President uh, Buhari, we talked about, oh, the debt level is not sustainable. Some people will come here and say, well, it's not that you can't borrow, uh, it's what you do with it. Mm. This same administration has said, well, you know, we're not going to uh, uh, punish the people with overtaxation, but our GDP to debt ratio, there is still uh, room for maneuver, which means that they will borrow more. So, I, I don't think saying, well, the future looks this and that, they, they're still going to borrow. That's number one. Number two, the uh, president uh, put together an economic team. I think 27 of them there or, or thereabouts. Now, and some of them are economists, some of them are chieftains of, uh, captains of industry and commerce. Now, do you think, from your own assessment of that economic team that President Tinubu has put together, that they will be able to offer better advice than the uh, Buhari economic team that uh, didn't offer the right kind of advice because we didn't see any kind of uh, impact in terms of results. I don't believe What's that. I don't, I don't believe that advice is a challenge. I think there are quite a number of bright people there, you know, including people like Tony Lumelu, you know, Dangote. They're very bright people, by the way. 
Um, I uh, think they were, some of them were in the same uh, Buhari No, no, you, you, you need to understand that there are also political uh, considerations here. So, you know, Dangote, uh, you know, uh, Tony Lumelu might offer very sound advice. These guys are speaking to the best, best minds in, in the country, okay? So the problem they have is usually execution, you know. Those, those are usually where the problems lie. And, and just to emphasize your point around, you know, you know how you, <laughs> you solve the problem, well, if we don't tackle these issues, I don't know if your producer wouldn't mind pulling up uh, slide 15. The implications for... You can prepare with slides. The, 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 the implication <laughs> is that, okay, we, we, we run the risk of seeing a downgrade of our credit rating. Okay, this is on slide 15, by the way. Uh, we run the risk of a weaker economy, potentially a recession, okay? Borrowing costs rise significantly, inflation, persistent currency problems, unrest, okay? The unrest in Kenya is a result of the government trying to, you know, put in place austerity measures to manage their debt crisis. Kenya is currently in a debt crisis. Sure. And that's why we had this problem with the protests. We can avoid that. We can avoid that, okay? These are very serious implications, and much worse going into a Trump presidency where oil prices could fall as low as 50%. Sorry, could fall as low as $50 to borrow. That's his mandate. All right, so let's, let's look at solutions, and, and I'm glad you've broken it down into immediate, medium, long term. Mm -hmm. In the immediate, Aside from, of course, we're talking numbers now, but taking it back to the first um, question that Dr. Bati had asked with regards to the inflation numbers, particularly food inflation, because of the level of poverty, hunger in the land. We can put no, the, uh, the people watching, some people watching, they're not interested in the number. They want, how can we they get food? Yes, yes. How can we get food on our table? How can we have a, 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 a sustainable livelihood? That's what a number of people are asking. So, of course, these... Uh, matters debt GDP debt to GDP to debt ratio they are all important and they all ultimately affect food on our table but you talk about immediate stabiliza stabilization measures you didn't put um, any intervention social welfare welfare interventions in that it's there it's in the medium it's term in the medium, as, but as it, something no 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 so, but so you don't think it's immediate no no so everything that I, I talk about short term medium term long term you also you start there you start the programs now but I'm saying that the impact should be kicking in by medium term, for example, in the long term. All right. So okay. in terms of, so if it's um, medium term, in terms of, I'm sure you heard of the bags of rice that are going yes, to, the, yes. to the governors. Those are short term measures. Short, yeah, yeah. short term measures. To what extent do you think that would? I don't think that was the best system? approach. I think it's inefficient. Uh, I think the best approach is the cash direct transfers that they've been making. Okay. Because, you know, when we now go into how the bags of rice, were, first of all, it's not, it's not enough. Okay. Yeah. I think I did the math on that, and it came to, I think, what, it's 20 trucks per... Yes. Okay? Per, per state. So that's per state. Yes. So that comes to about the roughly... 1,200 bags yeah. in one truck. So that's about 24,000 bags per state, right? Yeah. I mean, Lagos State, you have well, almost 20 million people. It's nothing. Uh, so I think that if you had, for example, distributed that across you know, maybe a few hundred thousand people and, you know, they ended up with about 70,000 naira, 6,000 naira per person in their account, that probably would have a lot more mileage than sharing bags of rice. Um, and I think that if we have to be frank with ourselves, okay, the road to recovery or even really, even, even supporting the most vulnerable, it's a very difficult one. The government is broke. It, the government is broke. This is a very so real thing. they're borrowing to also do this? They're borrowing to subsidize fuel, yeah. which is, is, it's crazy, at six trillion at the end of this year. Yeah. When your, your spend on health care, the same year, is 3,500 naira. Yeah. Yeah. That, right. that, that's what, you're totally spot on. And education, your spend on education is 6,000 uh, 6,500 uh, uh, naira. Your so, spend on security is 9,500 naira. So we have a, a debt crisis on our hands. And then what's by everyone using the money to do? Doesn't it make sense? Doesn't it make any sense. You can't account for the, for the debt that has built up over the last 
four or five years, what road uh, has been built? The Lagos Ibado Expressway, I believe it's still under construction. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's uh, uh, about 80% well, No, but it's still under construction. That's the point. After spending trillions of, tens of trillions of Naira. And uh, let me just make it more exciting for you. In all of this now, down they started a coastal road that is going to go up another 15 yeah. trillion where we are complaining that all of this. So, I mean, some of the measures you are saying is that. So, are you saying now that we should pull out the petroleum subsidy, which we all know they are still paying, because even recently Reuters ratted them out by saying that they couldn't pay some of their international traders about three or four billion of the money they are owing. Are you saying we should pull out the petroleum subsidy as we be, and make this economy just go a wire? A no, mad. it's not a matter of making it go a wire. Uh -huh. The thing is that by removing the subsidy, you take out the waste. I believe that almost half of that consumption is, is even fictitious, or you know, guys who are smuggling, taking the thing out of so the country. So you see what you, so, and, and, uh, you but, know, but, do you know but, the but implication? Let's assume we take that out, okay? Yeah. Hold on. Then we also need to address the, the, the most vulnerable in society. How do we address that? You know, um, stamps perhaps for, for, for transportation, okay? okay? Uh, perhaps for food and things like that. You can't take care of everybody, but let's address the most vulnerable people. Um, you know, people like you, Ayo, you can, you can buy petrol at 1,000 naira per litre. Really? You can afford that. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you know. No, no, don't say that. No, no. Speak, speak for yourself. <laughs> no. Speak but for I'm yourself. Saying, but I'm saying, like, look, at the risk of all the implications I just pointed out, what do you prefer? What, what, what would you prefer? So sacrifices See, no. have to be made. In all, in all fairness. Ca ca what? Can the producer, can the producer pull off slide six no. or page six? In all fairness, yeah. there is waste. Yeah. But also... With my empathic spirit, I do not believe taking off that subsidy where you know that this economy operates in a ricochet effect mentality, yeah. that you pull it up. Yeah. With the first subsidy removal that we had, we have not still recovered from it. You now want petrol to be 1,500 naira. I, wa I want your, your that producer would be the to implication. pull up page six. And so, so you can the understand. argument a lot of you yeah. make is this. Oh, when we pull out something, you can spend it on other welfare services. Yeah. The same people that we chop the money corruptly, is it the same people that this same money, you lose 25 trillion now, if we're not using it to pay subsidy, they are eating it. Uh, I mean, that's look, the look, as an argument. There's corruption. Have you no, solved look, the problem of corruption? Look, there are, they say what particular number? Number six. Number six, six, yes. Six. Number six. So, this same argument you make that, oh, the savings that is gotten from subsidy, we invest it in this, we invest it. That's a very ideological standpoint, too. The, with these ones that are very corrupt, they will eat that savings again. Didn't they tell us on the start that they have savings? This is Nigeria. Nigeria's debt to government revenue. Yes. Look at the countries that are there. Is that what you want? No, that's not what we want. But, but that is what we, 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 we would be. But the truth if is, if we case continue of that way, discipline. spending six trillion on subsidy. Yes. Yemen, you're in the same category as Yemen, Venezuela. Yes. It's, but but that is not only because of subsidies. Nigeria, Nigeria right now is at the top of countries at the risk already in a debt crisis. I get you. See, this is data. I'm talking practical reality. <laughs> See, that is not only because of subsidy. That is also because of lack of fiscal discipline here by the mm. government and massive corruption. Yeah. In all of this, I have still cited a coastal road that's going to go up 15, 15 trillion. When that 15 trillion... We've not done east-west road. Can be used to fix all the roads that are pre-existing. I've still cited for you a hundred and fifty million dollar bill for aircraft. I've still cited to you another close to twenty million dollar deal for presidential for vice presidential lodge. My, my, so if you save that money for subsidy and you give it to this government, they're still going to chop the money, chop it like Kobayashi. That's what we are saying. That's the sad reality. To ask you about conditional cash transfer. <laughs> IMF keeps talking about it. This mm. is about the second time. They are commending the Nigerian government. Partly because they are promoting it. They, they, they are, they are okay. Part of the but you and I live here, and we know that mm -hmm. this conditional cash transfer mm -hmm. is not working. And even in theory, mm -hmm. is it something you can use to address inflation? And what effect will it have on money supply, apart from the fact that it is thoroughly mismanaged? Maybe IMF does not see the mismanagement part of it. They are focusing I'm on. I'm not aware that it's being mismanaged. I think that it's not properly funded, uh, given the something level on which we don't even have a proper social register. Which Sarah, you, say that you, you live in this country. I do. You, say you are not aware. No, no, no. I do. But what I'm saying is that it's first of all, it's not. I don't think it's adequately funded. The government is only just really starting that journey of developing this program, frankly. Uh, but I think that. 
that could really be a basis for building some sort of safety net in Nigeria, okay? Using things like, you know, bank accounts. Of course, you're, ready, you're required to have a, a name, you know, BVN. You can track all of those. And, and that's what's very important to me, actually, as far as, we're, as, as, long, as long as we're talking about social safety nets. There needs to be, it needs to be digitized so that it's auditable. Mm. We can see who the monies we're giving to uh, and, and see just how much impact it's made on the lives of those families or households. That's part of what they're doing, by the way. So if that's the, sort of, if the, if that's the process, I'm 300% on board with that. Digitize it, make it auditable, and, but it needs to be adequately funded. This idea of yeah, just apart from funding, sending 20 trucks of rice, apart, it's, apart, that's a bit apart, loose. You, know, you don't know where the rice has gone. Yeah. If you remember during the COVID period, you had warehouses that were stacked up with rice and you know, all kinds of reliefs that were never disbursed. Yeah, that's but apart from funding, are you aware of the issues that have been raised about Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and poverty alleviation uh, and how I'm this aware. So what you do is you perhaps change that, you know, the, the, the drivers, the, the guys in charge, and put people who are perhaps credible and uh, are really keen to, to really drive that initiative. Because it's very important. You, you run the risk of having the kind of protests you had in, in, uh, in, 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 in Kenya. And I believe that that's why the government is quickly rolling out this, this issue of bags of rice and trying to distribute it to avoid that. Because, look, forget about loss of life. It will cost us a lot more economically. That's true. We've not recovered from it. Yeah. It will cost I, I us a lot. Yeah. We don't have time. We'll I wish we could talk about also the business environment because you also highlight that in terms of stimulating the business environment yeah. and the impact yeah. on even um, you know, creating an economy for the people, not just handouts not just giving out, not just the um, social safety nets, but actually small businesses, which are drivers of this particular economy. But mm -hmm. thank you so much. Um, there's I'll a lot to talk again. about. Yeah, yeah there's a lot to talk about. And uh, I, I don't know, I'm feeling like it's such a, you know, I don't know, hopeful, one hopeful note before you go. Okay. One hopeful note? Yes. Uh, it's, it's really tough. It's, like I said, I, I haven't been so happy sort of seeing sort of the, the sort of the prospects of a sort of a Trump presidency and its impact on Nigeria, especially given that the government isn't prepared. Okay, so that, we need that, to act that, fast. That's, yeah, we need to act very, very fast. Right. Okay. You know, because the market won't wait for Trump to be president before he reacts. Okay. Uh, if you look at Trump's last presidency, we had the same problem. We had a crisis with oil prices. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for your time with us. Thank you very very much. important matters we've discussed this morning, and hopefully, um, those who need to take action will take action. Thank, Thank you. you.